Hello, everybody, and welcome to Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatile. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. He is an engaging digital architect, coach, and trainer who empowers others through the transfer of knowledge. He is currently working for ALC Training and Consulting in Brisbane, Australia, where he develops and runs public and custom courses tailored to their clients' needs. He also coaches and mentors his clients, empowering them to bring cloud, cybersecurity, agile expertise, and best practices to their organizations. Prior to this, he was a senior principal cloud architect for DXC Technology, where he was a joint winner of the Citrix System Integrator Award 2017 for innovation on the DXC shared platform. His passion is helping people develop and grow through compelling stories and experiences. It is my pleasure to welcome the one and only Paul Colmer. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you so much. What an introduction. Um, fantastic to be here. And uh, thank you so much for having me on your show. So, absolute pleasure being here. Very excited. Oh, it's a pleasure having you. I'm so excited to be talking to you. You know, one of the things I love about uh, the global marketplace, I mean, here, here I am in New York, it's a Sunday afternoon, it's Monday morning for you. And it's just, I, I say it over and over again, and people are probably getting bored of hearing me say that, but I just find that really exciting. It, it is, the whole you know, digital world is it's so incredible. We've gone through such a transformation um, the last um, 10, 15 years, certainly since you know, I started uh, probably about 20 years ago as a solutions architect. And it's just phenomenal, you know, I've, I've built up, I guess, a, a range of different influences over the last two years. You're, you're certainly one of those key influences. And it's almost like I have this virtual world of people and networking I can reach out to. It's, it's just phenomenal. And, and I guess that's the typifies this whole age of digital disruption. Totally. I and, mean, you know, we both grew up in the age when making a long distance phone call was an ordeal. And now here we are, we're just talking face to face like it's nothing. Exactly right. In fact, I remember those days very clearly. And my dad used to work away a lot. He worked all around Europe. He worked as an, as a, an aerospace engineer, effectively. Um, he did design some incredible things to do with uh, the tornado and worked on Concorde. Um, so I remember having those conversations on the old phone, dog and bone, we used to say in the UK, um, the old <laughs> phone. And you just sit around waiting for that phone to ring, you know, at home. Whereas now, obviously, the phone is, is ubiquitous and it's part of you now. So it's, uh, it's instant. Information. Incredible. Absolutely. Yeah. It's completely instant. And that's a perfect segue to what we wanted to talk about today, which is that there's massive disruption taking place in every industry, you know, thanks to the rapid advancement in technology such as artificial intelligence, IoT, robotics, and so on. As someone who works in and mentors people on the forefront of cutting edge technology, what kinds of trends are you seeing regarding digital disruption? Yeah, so... Let's just back up a little bit. Let's just define that term digital disruption. So really that whole term, I guess, started with the mobile phone. You know, the mobile phone has almost been the, the starting point for that whole entire disruptive period. You know, you have app stores appearing with uh, um, Apple um, and those app stores uh, started to displace traditional types of businesses. Um, you, know, you have companies like Uber um, that are using cloud computing platforms to underpin and undermine uh, taxi companies around the world. Um, you have Netflix, you know, start starting to um, originally they undermined blockbuster video and now they're moving into digital media. Um, and so that whole that really typifies that whole digital transformation area of effectively smaller startup companies with generally a lot fewer resources than the mainstream large competitors. They come in and very quickly they start to undercut and undermine those very large companies. You know, the last company I worked for, um, I worked for for 12 years, DXC Technology, we had to undergo a massive digital transformation. So if you like the word digital transformation is the transformation you have to go to, through um, to become competitive in this modern world and to be a disruptor yourself. That's almost how those two um, titles, I think, come together. Um, and so that trend that we see um, has been you know, permeating. And it's not something that's going to be limited to companies. Um, you know, every area of IT, every area of industry will be affected. You know, we, we, we've seen it with, with taxes, with media. Um, we started to see it in the banking sector um, across the world. Uh, certainly in, in the U UK and US, it's, it's probably at a faster pace maybe than over in Australia, just because of the geography and the size um, of the population. Um, but what we're seeing is we're seeing that, um, that accelerate. 
Um, that digital disruption uh, really accelerates. Um, and, and now we're seeing that move to governments. Um, so my prediction, yeah. um, bit of a prediction here, um, is that every industry will be disrupted and that does include governments. Not entirely sure how that's gonna happen. It's certainly, I think, viable in the next five or 10 years, but everywhere from every area of technology, healthcare, all the way through to uh, governments will all be disrupted. And so everybody needs to pick up their games, even governments. Um, wow. And, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it, that's a really powerful statement because if you think about it, one of the greatest things about the Internet, which was uh, driving this massive digital disruption, is that it's the great equalizer. Anybody can become a rising star overnight. And it doesn't matter if you're a small business and you're competing against the big guys. If you do it right, if you're good enough, I mean, you know, you and I both, uh, we all know about Gary Vaynerchuk. You know, we hear him spouting that all the time. Uh, but, you know, it's true. If you're good enough and you do it right, you can really become the next superstar or the next big player. Now, think about governments. Uh, where I think that's going to take place or, or how that's going to take place is that if you think about some of the emerging markets, um, I was just having a conversation with someone today about outsourcing in India and digital compliance. And if these nations um, do, do it right with regards to compliance and data privacy, they could actually outpace the more developed countries in terms of uh, their uh, innovation and even economic growth. Uh, absolutely. In a way, the whole you know, general data protection regulation uh, movement in the EU is a form of disruption, if, if you think about it. You know, governments have done that to protect their citizens in the EU and, if you like, provide themselves with a possibly a disadvantage in some eyes, but I think an advantage in terms of being serious about data privacy. And I think then that gives um, an edge for companies to consider, well, maybe I'll, I'll deal more with, you know, I've host my, my services in the EU, obviously I have already EU um, clients, and maybe bring more business. I think it's actually start part of that whole competitive strategy. It's, it's also about protecting people's rights and around cybersecurity and, and, and preventing those malicious actors and those, those threats, you know, like potentially like Russia and China. Um, um, but I, I think it's also it's part of this whole digital disruption. And I, I guess that's the, partly the government's reaction to this. And there'll be other things that come through. And already GDPR, I don't know if you're aware, is, is become, is parts of it have become law here in Australia. We have uh, um, breach notices now that are compulsory. They have been now for about uh, six or nine months, um, pretty much not, not long after the, uh, the, the May deadline uh, happened last year for GDPR. I think in the US there are moves now to yeah. unify and, and strengthen privacy regulation because it's, it is a competitive differentiator and it's part of disruption. And, and you know what, I, what I've said all along while uh, GDPR was still brewing is that I think it's going to become a gold standard because data privacy is on everybody's mind. Uh, we had the privilege of hearing from Bill Mew on one of, our, one of our previous episodes and he had said that this is the number one concern that consumers have today is are the companies that we do business with really serious about protecting our data and our privacy so the whether or not it's a law i mean the law is really more about legislation and and ramifications about what happens uh if something goes wrong but in terms of a corporation wanting to differentiate themselves it makes a lot of business sense to voluntarily focus on data privacy protection and make that a core part of your strategy. It, it does. It's, it's so, so important to protect the privacy of people because that's, that's what they want. And as we've seen, you know, um, time and time again, often the will of the people, look at the Facebook, the hashtag delete Facebook movement, right? And Facebook's reaction, uh, Mark Zuckerberg fessed up and said, look, guys, I have made a mistake. We need to change things. Um, there you go. And, and that really leads into some cybersecurity concerns as well, you know, um, we, we talk about GDPR in the EU and obviously Australian um, um, law changing as well. But also we, we're looking at China as well and Russia as potential, um, you know, very big economic threat. Certainly China is a huge economic threat to the rest of the world. I'm not sure they're necessarily a, a political threat, but certainly I think an, an economic threat. And in terms of disruption, I certainly see China as the next big place where there's going to be a lot of small startups coming out of China. It's already happening. Um, there's a lot of innovation coming out of China. Huge. Well, Alibaba, for example, if you, if you look at the top six cloud providers 
um, in Australia. I think ZDNet published it in February, Alibaba number six. Um, it's true that's only IaaS. It's not software as a service, only infrastructure, but Alibaba number six. And, you know, a year ago, no one even heard of them. It's incredible. Yeah. Amazon at number, well, actually Microsoft, I think is number one now and Amazon at number two um, by, by revenue. Certainly that's how that's measured. So it's, um, yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty exciting, incredibly fast changing world. So the Alibaba I predict will, will be number three probably in, in the next six months a year. Um, I predicted that um, uh, Microsoft will be number one in cloud uh, and they are certainly, certainly with their Office 365 makes a very powerful player. Um, but yeah, For sure. the whole world changing as, we, as we're unfolding. As we, it, it's a very fast pace <laughs> and, and that's all part of this uh, wave of digital transformation. So we touched upon cybersecurity. What kind of trends are you seeing with regards to the ways companies employ cybersecurity and data privacy protection? Yeah, so, well, one of the flagship courses I run, it's, it's a really good course, is the CCSP, the Certified Cloud Security Professional. Um, if anybody uh, is familiar with security, they've probably heard of CISP. Well, the CCSP is almost the cloud equivalent. Um, so it's a five-day course that we run. And one of the basics that we focus on is what we call the treacherous 12. They're the top 12 cloud security threats. And no, no surprise, guess what's number one? It's data breach. Um, mm -hmm. No surprise there. Um, and so what we do, we, we, um, when we run the course, we understand, uh, we are, I ask all the clients here, what are their biggest challenges? And, and sure enough, usually they fit in the top four or five. So the, the first one is data breach. Um, system vulnerabilities is, is in the top four. Um, insecure APIs um, is in there. And then further down, we start to see other ones like malicious actor um, and things like shared technology vulnerabilities. Those hypervisor vulnerabilities are really right down the bottom. But we see a lot of data breach. Um, and particularly some of the challenges I think companies that have in terms of a data breach. Um, traditional security is, you know what? We'll, we'll lock the doors. We'll put four fences round, round our moat. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, within our moat, and, and then we'll put more defenses and we'll be secure and we won't let anyone in. Well, I'm sure 20 years ago that worked as a great strategy, but today all, all the services are highly interconnected. Everyone needs to interact. That whole uh, premise around uh, blocking everything doesn't, doesn't work. You so, can't just disconnect today. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, you, you do, you know, and you end up being the no department. So, you know, I have quite a few people wanting to change that whole perception. They're really positive people that come into my class. They want to change that no perception. And so what we need to move from is one of, we still need best practice in security, but we need to move to one of uh, responding to incidents. So we're likely to have an incident in, in a company. So I, I guarantee that all this, I said to my students and they frightened me a little bit. I said, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, in the next 10 years, you're going to be involved in at least one, maybe several data breaches. Um, One of the things that I hear a lot of the experts saying over and over again is that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Absolutely right. So, and you're seeing it all the, all the time. Um, you know, you're going to go through a data breach. And the key uh, with a data breach is it's how you react with your client. So when I worked for DXC Technology, we, we had a service desk, we had incidents, we had outages. It's part of life. And so you've got to get really good at dealing with those incidents. And the most important part is holding the hand of your client and going, we've got this, we're with you. You know, something's happened, we don't know what it is, let's just get through this hard time, let's just recover what we can, minimize the damage, and then we can look at the root cause and then prevent that systemic thing from happening again. Um, because in security, there's very much a lot of the unknown. You know, you don't know what you don't know, right? So um, you still need best practice, but there's a high focus on responding to incidents, holding the hand of the client and building that trust with the client. That's probably the most important thing you can do working in IT today. Another buzzword that people hear about over and over again is big data. What is that? Yes. Well, let me give you a, 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 bit, of a, a bit of a story. Um, so I've been a, a solution architect for 20 odd years. And one of the roles that the solution architect has to go through, he has to understand what we call current state. So you have to understand what systems, people and processes um, that a business has. Um, and in order to that, you need data. Um, and generally as an architect, I call that little data. You, you're generally dealing with maybe a few thousand records. I think the biggest data set I probably dealt with is maybe, you know, we're talking a few years ago, maybe 50,000, um, uh, which, is, which is quite a lot, a lot of data. So you might have, you know, uh, 20,000 records and you might have a, 10 sets of fields sort of going across. So quite a, quite a few data items, but that, that's, that's really small, right? Um, 
certainly uh, 20 years ago, that was because it's medium, maybe a little bit large, but these days it's pretty small. Um, so really big data is, is all about making sense and making really good businesses around very, very large sets of data. So when we're talking large sets, we're generally talking millions of lines and maybe hundreds, if not thousands of uh, fields moving across. So we're talking about vast data sets. And really the big difference is the way in which you treat that data. So little data up to 100,000 records, I can bring that into Excel, I could do some filtering, I could do some sorting, I could pretty much massage the data pretty much by eye, um, assuming of course I, I've got good clean data. And, and as any good data scientist will tell you, 80% of the time is spent collecting data and 20% and of the time is, is, is uh, moaning about how bad it is to collect the data. That's certainly <laughs> my experience, that's certainly me, me all over I think. Um, uh, but with today's um, big data uh, trend, where you've got a lot of data, you've also got a, um, a fast amount of data coming at you, so the data can change very quickly. Data quality has always been important, and we're talking about very, very large volumes. To put this into uh, context for, mm -hmm. for everyone, I mean, with, with the IoT devices being added on a daily basis, I think we're up to something like 50 billion devices in the next few years there's going to be reams and reams and reams of data being collected. Absolutely. You remember, uh, I hope your audience have heard of Moore's law with the uh, processing power. So Moore's law also applies to storage. It applies to big data. You know, I'll give you, I'll give you a really good example. So um, I do a lot of social media, as you know, and I, I take pictures and I've recently downloaded a free Google app called Snapseed. And what it does, it allows me to tweak the colors and, and make the picture look amazing. And I realized that I've, I've gone from taking one photo to then manipulating Snapseed, creating another one and creating another one. So all of a sudden I've tripled the number of photos that I may take now just in the last week by adding an app. And, I'll, and then potentially in, in another six months, there'll be another app where I can add another app. And all of a sudden I'm not taking one, I may be taking 10 or 20. So there's an example of why that growth is exponential. Um, we're seeing that whole um, innovation space of different apps proliferating data effectively in storage. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, uh, you know, you're really bringing that home right now to to my own personal experience as well with regards to photos and then with just with regards to our, our own uh, digital footprint. I mean, everything that we do is recorded and tracked. You know, we've got our smartwatches. <laughs> that's recording data. And these are things we didn't have uh, just a few years ago. Uh, absolutely right. In fact, I did a really cool uh, presentation. It was about four years ago at Gartner on, on wearables. And... Um, Basically what I'd done, I, I bought one of the early Fitbits and um, I'd also downloaded some apps. So I had about three data sources for steps and for sleep. And I basically took all the data, I added my food and diet in there. And I actually did a, a bit of a, yeah, a, a bit of a, um, um, let's take all the data and let's manipulate and see, see what we've got. And uh, using some data science techniques, so I learned a bit, little bit of our programming. It wasn't, not really, not, wasn't really that great at the time. And I basically found out some really cool things, you know, things like um, I was low in iron. Um, I, I worked out that alcohol, even one small, uh, you know, schooner or beer, a pint of beer, uh, would affect my sleep patterns dramatically. Um, I was very low on vitamin C. So I was able to make some real lifestyle changes. And then I tracked what, what that would do. And all of a sudden I was getting better sleep. I wasn't so tired. So I mapped that through and I gave a whole, it was about a 20 minute presentation on that. So you're right. Absolutely. The, you know, the, the, the use of that data is really critical. And that's a really good example of how you can take maybe not millions of records, but even a small data set, use some data science techniques, a little bit of our programming, and look at, look at that, that's a, that's a huge change for me. So that was, that was a real turning point in my life. Yeah, and, you know, that, and that's a great point, and this is, what the, this is what drives this technology, because it's not just about having a cool watch or having cool stuff lying around our house or, or, you know, or our cities, it's about actually making changes to our lives for the better. Now, one of the things that goes hand in hand with big data is artificial intelligence, because like you said, in our, in our own little world, little data, yeah, we could just take a look at the data and tweak it. But when we have hundreds of thousands and millions and billions of devices all pushing out loads of data simultaneously, a human just cannot possibly process all that data. Absolutely. And, and AI is one of those uh, technologies as well that's already very mature. It's been around a long time. So true. Um, so AI really consists of what we might call machine learning. So machine learning has been around since the 60s, been around a long time. And we've also got a concept called deep learning, been around probably since the 
mid to early to mid 80s. So those technologies, a bit like blockchain, um, blockchain is a very new technology, hasn't been around long and we're not seeing many good results. Whereas AI, we're seeing fantastic results. It's a question of maturity. Um, and the fit, I use a Fitbit again as an example. So what, one of the ways that Fitbit um, designed uh, the, uh, the, um, the Fitbit to be reasonably accurate, it's not perfect for steps, is they feed it data. They feed it lots of data and say, this is, this is data that equates to steps. This is data that equates to running, cycling, different activities. And, and then, then they the tweak AI, it. Correct. And then the AI um, is able to learn from that. Now, what's important is they get good data. They understand what is good running data, what is good walking data. So you can see the data science around that is really, really, really important. Um, and so that's the key to AI. You need really good data, really good data science. And then the models, um, once, you, once you pick the right um, machine learning and deep learning models, and there are thousands you can choose. Again, the data science expertise is required there. You get incredible products like Fitbit. Another example, Tesla. Uh, the, drive, the driverless car or the enhanced autopilot is really what, what they're developing. Um, version 9, you should take one for test drive, incredible. Drives itself on the motorway. Kid you not. No one believes when they go, no, it doesn't drive itself. I said, yeah. The, you Literally, you get onto the, the, the main highway. And I'll give you a specific example. We were driving down the highway, car in front was doing, um, we have kilometers in our hair, not miles an hour, so bear with me, guys. Um, but it was doing 60 kilometers an hour in a 90 kilometer an hour zone. And it's tracking, you know, about 50 meters behind the car. And I can change that setting. And uh, the car peeled off, accelerated up to 90 at the speed limit. And it was tracking perfectly in the lane, probably better than I could ever do it. It wasn't, it wasn't ginseng or, or doing anything silly. It was, it was able to detect the car in front. And then two minutes later, a car pulls over in front. And what does it do? It slows down. No hands. It's, I thought, wow, this, I want one. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> After the latest update, it came about two months ago. And this is going to get better. So... AI is, I'm just a huge fan of AI. It's incredible. We're going to have to do a sequel on Tesla. Yes, we, we will. So um, um, I've done, a, I did a number of presentations last year, the year before around um, mainly um, Australia, New Zealand, a little bit of Malaysia as well, where I talked about the, uh, the Model S, which is the uh, quite mature um, higher end uh, a car. Um, but I want to bring a, a Model 3 version Model 3 is hot in the US. It's coming out here in Australia later this year. So we'll have to do a sequel to that. So I've got, well, some, absolutely. I've got some great great pieces on that. So that'd be great. <laughs> Super. Now let's just veer off a little bit into the world of blockchain because you mentioned that uh, you haven't seen any, any good uh, examples of blockchain and everybody's talking about blo blockchain like it's the best thing since sliced bread. <laughs> <laughs> so what have you been seeing? You're absolutely right. So um, certainly in terms of industry. So what's great about being a coach and a trainer is, you know, I run courses every other week. So typically in a year I run, I think I did 26 uh, trips uh, literally last year. So, so I, you know, in each class to be 10 to 20 people. And I tend to ask them about what trends they're seeing. And I can tell you in the commercial industry in Australia, no one it seems to be deploying blockchain at scale in production. There's lots of proof of concepts. There's lots of people trying it out but there's nothing um, that's tangible, nothing that seems to be behind the scenes. Um, now, maybe Australia's a, a unique bubble, but I saw a really interesting article from McKinsey yesterday um, around how, how blockchain is going to take many years for blockchain to become um, productionized. And, and my understanding of blockchain, I'm no, no expert, is that scalability is the issue. When you're talking around maybe thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of blocks in a chain, it takes a long time for those new blocks to be assimilated. You know, in our real-time environment, that doesn't really work where we want everything now, when it, we want payments instantly. Almost blockchain is the antithesis of that. So I don't really know how, how that's gonna reconcile. Um, yeah. There, I there wonder is, if quantum computing will fix that problem. Well, very, very interesting you, you mentioned. So there was a great presentation from um, Michael Beerkirk about three years ago. I think he's University of, uh, uh, Sydney, he's one of the professors there in quantum, so he really knows his, his stuff. And, and uh, you know, he frequently asked questions. I put my hand up and I said, Really, how long is quantum computing away from being mainstream? And he said, um, Realistically, probably 15, 20 years, maybe, maybe 10, maybe, but he's not convinced. He still thinks it's on the 15, 20 years. And he gave a really good example. He, he goes, The challenge is with any research and development is, um, Sure, we have accelerators in today's world like cloud computing that can speed things up. Um, but unfortunately, quantum computing and other technologies 
are a considerable leap forward in terms of complexity of what we've done in the past. Um, so it's a bit like the, the, the Moore's law almost applying, you know, that you can't shortcut those things. And he said, look, how long did it take for mainframes to become more mainstream? How long did it take to become PCs to become mainstream? Um, so use those as specific examples and, and, and almost in the quantum era, cloud as well has taken some time, isn't it? 10, 15 years or 10 years. To come even, even mobile phones. I mean, uh, the smartphone was just introduced maybe 12, 13 years ago. You're absolutely right. And I think what you're seeing there is, is there's a level of complexity with these things that just take time. And also there's the resist to change factor. People don't necessarily want to embrace things. They, they want to hang on to what they're used to doing. You know, the, the example, of course, the reason electric cars have taken so long is because no one's championed electric cars until Elon Musk came along and did exactly let that. Someone else, let someone else do it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. And the, you know, the, the regular company was happy to, to put along with their petrol cars, right? And, and it's only and, and maybe a bit of hybrid here and there. Again, that's driven by Tesla. You're seeing hybrid cars because of the influence of Tesla. If it wasn't for Tesla, we'd be still be, we'd be on LPG probably, which was a, a threat for a time, right? <laughs> to petrol. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. So um, the quantum computing, yeah, um, I, I think it's, um, like, like Michael said, 10 years, best case. Um, he, he thinks realistically 15. Um, so there's a long way to go. Um, and, and there's all these things. There'll be a gradual sort of transition into those things. So obviously there's fears in cybersecurity, for example, of, oh, my God, what happens if all the encryption is rendered useless? It means all the information previous can now be read, if it, even if it's encrypted. So all of a sudden, data you thought was safe now in 15 years' time of quantum computing can now be read if it's, even if it's encrypted. So that really does change the game, doesn't it, around data privacy? As soon as the bad guys get hold of those quantum computers, we're toast. Exactly right. So you want to make sure the good guys get the first right. So <laughs> the University of uh, Sydney are, are working on this as we speak, and, and so are many other great universities around the world, especially in the US. You're doing some great work over there in quantum, quantum computing. So it's exciting, exciting area, very exciting. Totally. <laughs> So let's go back to cloud. Um, and you mentioned ZDNet. Uh, in, in an article published by ZDNet in November 2018, they wrote about the Guinness World Records. And they stated that cloud computing is the key to their digital transformation. What do businesses need to know as they contemplate migrating to the cloud? Yes. Yeah, so, um, one of the important things with the maturity of cloud is certainly in Australia, and I think it's the same in the US and UK, everybody's now moving to the cloud. You know, um, there's a lot of companies that have started maybe three or four years ago. Um, they've started with Office 365 um, and they've moved to maybe Amazon and, and other types of uh, services. Um, and that's taken uh, two or three years, but certainly we're in a very uh, reasonably mature uh, phase now. A lot of people are adopting cloud. And the biggest challenge I think you, you find with cloud is the fact that security posture changes. Um, some people believe that security is less than the cloud. Some people be it's more. Um, basically, the roles and responsibilities change. So it's a new new way of, um, of managing risk. And it's understanding that when you move to, for example, Amazon Web Services, they are going to take risk for the physical infrastructure, for the physical locations. You have very little control over how that is managed and, and what those physical items look like. And if you're a business, you probably don't care. Um, you have control over the what workloads or virtual machines you can place in different locations. And that causes a problem in itself. You know, where does my data live in the cloud? Um, for example, I sign up for Dropbox. Where does my data live? The reason that data and where it lives is so important is, is what laws apply to that data. Mm -hmm. So you can end up with quite a complex situation. I'll give you a quite a complex example. This is a common scenario we might find with um, very cutting edge sort of commercial clients. Um, they have a company that's based in Australia. Um, so there's a whole heap of regulation they may need to uh, abide by. Um, they host the workloads in the US and, and maybe the company is, a, is an offshore company in the, in the EU. Um, add to that, they have a range of clients across the world. They have US clients, EU clients and Australian clients. Now, all of a sudden you can see there's GDPR ch ch uh, challenges in the, in the EU from, from uh, that data perspective. You've got US regulation. Uh, you've got Australian um, law as well, sorry, not regulation, law. So you've got law. Law is anything that has the word act at the end. And then you have the regulation. So you might have different regulation uh, managing different um, parts of the world. And then you might have uh, overall some sort of industry regulation. So in Australia, we, you know, it might be financial services, for example, or healthcare, depending on the industry. So try to reconcile and seek advice from different uh, legal entities around how you navigate that can be really complicated. 
Um, sure. And some nations even have a data sovereignty rule or law that uh, the data has to reside in their country. Exactly. So a great example is Russia. Um, so um, it, I think it came out in 20, uh, um, 2016. Um, but there's a law there that says if you're keeping data around Russian citizens, it has to be within that, hosted within that country, within Russia. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's one, one such example. Um, not sure about China. I think China might have similar rules, but certainly Russia has that. But, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Cool. You know, Paul, this has been a really fascinating conversation and I'd love to know a little bit more about the technical courses you teach and also what kinds of businesses would benefit most from these classes. Yeah, that's right. So um, there's a range of different courses. So I, I run about 12 courses, um, I guess, because I get, I get bored quite easily. So I, I like to have a, a good range of courses. There's about six cloud courses I run. Um, the, the, the most popular types of courses tend to be what we call the non-technical or semi-technical type courses. So the certified cloud security professional, that's the uh, CCSP. Um, we also do more technical courses like Amazon Azure. Um, but more importantly, one, one of the things that we, we really like running are the, uh, um, the executive workshops and the non-technical uh, courses. For me personally, they're really quite challenging um, because you slip in a, a technical word somewhere and someone will pull you up and go, what does that mean? And often in IT, you might know what the acronym means, but do you really understand what the term means? So that could be a bit of a, a bit of a challenge. So two of my really favorite courses that I'm running are the Cloud Foundation course. That's a two-day course for completely uh, non-technical people. And the other course that we write running is the half-day or four-day sort of executive workshop. Um, they're really great uh, courses uh, to run. Um, we can tailor them as well. Um, in fact, we don't necessarily have to have them as courses. We can actually run those as workshops. Um, the cloud foundation can lead to a certification. The half day and, and four day um, cloud uh, workshop, uh, cloud um, overview, so to speak. We, we tend to, I tend to like running as a workshop. So don't think of them so much as training courses. Certainly the two day is more geared to a certain as training, but the, the, one, the half day or one day a cloud overview um, session is really a workshop. It's a workshop to understand, you know, where is the business at at the moment? What are some of the business challenges that you're dealing with? And pretty much let's develop a roadmap together over those two days around how we get from A to B, you know, and basically we want to move it in small steps. We want to move it in small agile steps. The reason we do it in small steps is so that we can make a change, um, learn from that, move forward, make a change, learn from it, move forward. That learning is important to do in small cycles. If we do, for example, um, a big, a waterfall step change we do something for three months and then we do some learning we've got to undo three months of changes if there's a problem whereas if we do it in a week and do something small it doesn't work we can throw it away what we call pivot and then let's just tweak that and do it slightly differently it's success yes the other reason we like i like the uh, the weekly it's very much aligned to agile is we should be doing system demos on a weekly basis so the old way of doing things what, what we call big upfront design uh, where an architect would disappear for six months come up with this grand plan of things to do and the business look at them and go man i think you might have needed to talk to us about some of that because half of it's wrong you know what i mean so um you know my my approach is literally to understand uh, requirements again we want to do this very quickly in a number of hours just sketchboard some of the simple concepts they might want to achieve and then we build a very quick prototype and a demo and within a week we need to have some runs on the board and then within two or three weeks we can start to look at building out features two or three months we can maybe have a a product then that has a, um, some complete features. And over, over a year, we might have a complete product that we're ready to go to market. Depends on the size of the project, really. Um, so, yeah, the great thing about the, the cloud uh, workshop is it can be tailored to any industry. So banking clients, um, technology clients, um, I guess any client that's really struggling with that whole digital transformation and cloud transformation journey. So I often start with you know, the cloud and understand the, the types of services that they they may wish to employ. And, and often it spills into, well, what about your big data strategy? What about your data science strategy? What about making better decisions with, with data? And so these, always these little compartments that we talk about in technology all sort of come together. Um, but really it, it's any company. Um, uh, and for me, the demographics, you know, I'm looking to work with, I, I work with already a lot of companies in Australia. At DXC Technology, I work with a number of uh, very large American companies. So Textron, uh, we, we ran um, and various workshops through, um, um, eBay um, was, a, was another client um, and I'd love to do some more work I don't do a lot these days just because 
um, of circumstance, I guess. But I'd love to do some more work maybe on the, on the West Coast in California. So any, anyone in Silicon Valley, come and, come and talk to me. Uh, we'd love to <laughs> help you guys out um, with, with some of your journeys. But yeah, um, really something we can tailor to, to any sort of, any, any sort of uh, a client, really. Awesome. Now, how do people connect with you? Yeah, the best way to connect with me um, is on LinkedIn. Um, you can also reach out on Instagram and, and Twitter, but LinkedIn I tend to uh, um, really like as a platform. So all my students, I always make sure I add them onto the LinkedIn platform. And with them, I always have a lifetime warranty. I say no matter what happens, whether you go for your exam, whether you pass or fail, maybe in four years' time you have a really tough problem, tap me up on LinkedIn and we'll talk. So I have literally two or three LinkedIn uh, people come to, to me every week asking questions around what they need to do. And I, I give that advice, you know, free, free of charge just to, um, just to keep them on their path. It's really important. I help them develop and, and that development journey doesn't just stop when I stop the course, it continues um, throughout their career. Nice. So what I'll do is I'll post your LinkedIn profile to the show notes so people can just click on it and get right to you. Perfect. I'm really easy to find. You can just Google me as well. Paul Colmer. So Paul, C-O-L-M for Mother E-R. Google it. You'll not only see all my IT stuff, you'll see some music stuff too. So you can have some fun with that. Um, I'll and we'll you. see some of your uh, world-class uh, selfies as well. Uh, absolutely. Hashtag selfie with Paul if anyone's uh, uh, watching. So yeah, feel free. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Paul, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? Oh, what a question. Um, yes, I do. Um, so one of the things I often uh, talk about with students um, is do something different every day. Um, and what that means is it doesn't have to be something big. It doesn't have to mean something life changing. It could be something small. Um, so one example of a small thing you might do differently, you might take a walk every morning, a 20 minute walk. Um, maybe one day think about taking a different route because by taking a different route on that walk, You'll see different things. You'll experience new things. You might meet someone. That might change your life. It might open up a business opportunity. That's exactly how I ended up training with ALC. I did something different. I went to a particular breakfast, um, a particular time uh, that I wouldn't normally go to, and I happened to meet uh, an ex-colleague of mine. We started talking. We met his business partner, and the rest became history. So very important. If you're not happy with your life, you need to do something different because if you do the same thing, you'll get the same outcome. Um, so I'm always encouraging my, my students to do something different every day because that's how you transform a person. What a great way to wrap up this episode. Paul, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you on the show. No worries. Thank you so much, Abra, for having me. It's been great fun, guys.